Good evening, everybody. It's 7 o'clock. Time for us to begin. Uh, we're glad that everybody has decided to be here tonight for our midweek study. Uh, these times of uh, meeting between the Sundays are always uplifting, a chance for us to get together to study God's Word, to encourage one another, and I'm thankful that we're all able to be here tonight. Uh, so we're thankful for all the members that are here, those who are visiting with us. We hope that uh, that what we're doing here is pleasing to you and you're able to be uplifted and edified by our service tonight. Uh, we're, we've been studying the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, last week was our first study in this series, and in that, in that study we introduced the epistle uh, that Paul wrote, uh, the first uh, epistle to the Corinthians, and today we're going to be getting into the text itself. Uh, what I'd like to do before we get started with the text tonight is just do a brief review of some of the things that we discussed uh, last week and that were included in last week's study. Uh, in the first place, who wrote this epistle? Paul, the apostle, okay? So Paul was the author of this epistle. Uh, what was the date and place of writing? A little more tricky here. Good. Written from the city of Ephesus, probably on the third missionary journey of Paul, uh, around 55 AD, uh, give or take. This was probably uh, two to three years after uh, his planting or his leaving the congregation uh, in Corinth. Who's the audience? Who's he writing to? Congregation at Corinth. Congregation at Corinth. What are, what are some things that we know about this congregation? They weren't doing right. Good. Anything else? Anything special about this city? They had some corruption. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was a singular love thing, and he worked lots of blood to make it to it. Okay, good. Very uh, geographically, uh, a very strategic location. A lot of idol worship. Well, I'm sorry, idol worship. Yes, absolutely. Uh huh. Very large city. I believe it was the fourth largest in the Roman Empire. So, a very large city, a prominent place. Good. Anybody else? Good. That, that encompasses a lot of what we talked about last week. Uh, what was the, the, the overall purpose of this book? How about this? What was, the, what was the occasion for writing? What was it that sparked Paul writing this letter? Problems. In the church. Problems. He's writing primarily to address issues that this church was, uh, was experiencing uh, in, their, in their infancy as the church, uh, assimilating the church uh, culture into the culture uh, the larger Corinthian culture at large. Uh, very good. So it was written primarily to address problems, which we talked about. Uh, what did we say were the key chapters? And, you know, you could, there's a lot of chapters that are very important, but if you had to pick one or two, what would be kind of the key chapters? Chapter 13. Chapter 13, which is a chapter about love. And that's what this is all about. Uh, the problems they were having stemmed primarily from a lack of agape biblical love from each other, for each other. And in chapter 13 is probably one of the most famous pieces of scripture in describing what biblical love is all about. And so 13 is a prominent chapter. Now what's another prominent chapter in this epistle? 15, 15 why? It uh, has to do with resurrection. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. Chapter 15, very uh, probably one of the most detailed accounts of the centrality of the resurrection, why that event was so important, how Christianity stands or falls upon Christ's resurrection and evidences for that, and also the fact that that resurrection serves as the Christian's hope of their own resurrection. And so chapter 15, very prominent in that regard. We also talked about in our discussion questions about Paul's experience up until this point and why his having 20 years of missionary experience uh, brought him a certain level of credibility with the Corinthians and a certain level of experience that enabled his ministry to be more uh, fruitful. Uh, we talked about the geography of Corinth, which we, which we just hit on, and also we talked about the culture's impact on living faithfully. Uh, a great deal of our discussion had to do with uh, the culture of society at large and how the church is to function and operate within that culture. And that's one of the big things we're going to learn from this book, especially as it applies to us today, is that we need to learn how we as Christians are to operate in, in the world around us. 
Unfortunately for the Corinthians, the world was influencing more than they were influencing the world. And the church looked a lot more like the world than it did uh, the type of people that they were called to be. And so uh, that's some of what we talked about uh, last time. And so to introduce this text, we're now going to get into the text itself, enter into chapter 1. And here in the first nine verses, we have probably the most positive verses in the entire epistle. In the first nine verses, uh, uh, it's an introduction. Uh, Paul is identifying that he is the writer. He's identifying to, who he, to whom he's writing. He's giving a thanksgiving, uh, a prayer for the, for the congregation, and it's a generally positive tone uh, that we find here in the first nine verses before he starts to get into the problems uh, that the church was experiencing. And so uh, we're going to go ahead, and uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll read the text, and last time we started in the beginning uh, in the front of the class, and this time we'll start in the back. And so what we'll do is just go through, we'll read the first nine verses, and if we'll uh, start, uh, do, do y'all want to read in the back back here, Travis, Miss Gloria? <coughs> They're pointing at each other. <laughs> All right, you don't, ha- you don't have to read, uh, but for those who'd like to, just go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll start in verse one. We'll start with Miss Joanne, and we'll work this way, and we'll just get through these first nine verses. If you would not like to read, just say pass, and that's okay. Verse 2? No, you just read one, we'll go to the next. I'm sorry. Ms. <laughs> Audrey's forced me to clarify. Yeah, just verse 2, and then we'll go on to verse 3 and so forth. Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye be unreprovable in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Very good. Thank you to all that read. Um, so here in the introduction, uh, you could really break this down into two major parts. You could break down the first three verses as sort of being the general uh, introduction to the letter. And then in verses 4 through 9, the thanksgiving. You could call that the thanksgiving portion because he's giving thanks to God for certain things uh, on behalf of the Corinthians. And so uh, I mentioned last week that in this class, I'd like to start to shift from less lecture to more discussion because all of our unique insights and backgrounds and years of Bible study, uh, everybody brings something to the table. And I think if we can all study the same subject matter, and come together uh, in these times that we have and be able to discuss things, I think everybody will get more out of the class and uh, our study will be a lot deeper. But we will still have, uh, I'll I'll go through and just kind of briefly talk about these verses and when we're done we'll go through and answer the questions at the end and then eventually the discussion questions. And so uh, let's let's look at these verses here. Look at verse 1. And what I've done here, by the way, uh, this is primarily the King James Version, and what I've done is in the brackets like where you see as and and then the third line by. I've looked at about uh, eight other translations in the English and tried to kind of find some words uh, that show the way different translations have it to maybe help in a smoother understanding of the word. And so uh, that's what those uh, represent there. So Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through or by the will of God. So Paul is identified as the author. We won't talk a whole lot about Paul. He's called to be an apostle. You see that to be, 
how that's in italics if you have a King James, that is supplied by the translators because in the original language it literally says a called apostle. He's just identified as a called apostle. He's an apostle who is called uh, to a divine mission of Jesus Christ through or by the will of God. And so in doing this, in regards to Paul's apostleship, he was summoned or commissioned to be an apostle by the Lord Jesus Christ. This refers to the special office of the apostle. Of course, Paul was an apostle that was a little different from the rest, but I'll save that for our discussion questions. But he was commissioned by the Lord, and he is communicating also the divine source of his mission. He's saying, what I'm doing is not of human source. This is a divine mission. It's from the divine mind. It's according to his will, his purpose. He's identifying that his purpose is directly from God. It's not of human source. Now, some have said that Paul's referring to his apostleship here sort of to defend it in the sense that somebody, uh, some of the Corinthians have been attacking his apostleship at this point. But really, when you look at the first Corinthian letter, it doesn't appear that his apostleship is yet being attacked. In 2 Corinthians, that will be the case. He spends a great deal of time defending his apostleship. But here it's probably the case that he is just reminding them of who he is and what his mission was. One has said it this way. Paul sees his apostleship not as an instrument of power, but as a call to become a transparent agency through whom the crucified and raised Christ becomes portrayed through lifestyle, thought, and utterance. Paul tried everything he could to minimize himself, minimize his image, and tried to make it so when people looked at him, they didn't see Paul, they saw Jesus Christ. It's as if you have two people standing in a line. If I were to ask Ken to get up here in the front, and I were to ask Ed to stand behind him, and I was looking at Ken, Paul didn't want me to see Ken. Paul wanted me to see past Ken as if he were a transparent figure and to see Ed behind him. And in Paul's case, Paul would be the one in the forefront, Christ behind that's why Paul could say in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, uh, left my mind. Let's turn there. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, where Paul is telling that it's, not, it's no longer he that lives in and of himself, it's Christ that's living in him. Let's look at that passage together. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. And if whoever's next in line, Miss Laura, if you would read that for us. good. So Paul had crucified himself, but the irony was, it's not as if he was dead, he was still alive, but it wasn't him living to himself, it was Christ who was living in him. And so when Paul refers to his apostleship, sometimes it's to defend his office as an apostle, his divine mission, but at other times he's referring to it, indicating uh, that it is Christ who's living through him, and the mission was divine. And so that's verse 1. And also at the end of verse 1 it says, and Sosthenes our brother. The way I remember how to pronounce that name is as if somebody's pouring some barbecue sauce on their knees. That's just a silly way to remember it, but it's sauce the knees. That's how you pronounce that. I, th I thought I'd get a few chuckles on that one. Good. Okay, so Sosthenes. Who is Sosthenes here? Um, well, Sosthenes, we're not really sure of his identity. What we do know about Sosthenes was that he was a traveling companion of Paul, that he was a brother in Christ, and apparently was known to the Corinthian church, or else Paul would not have mentioned him in this letter. But some have said that this is the same Sosthenes that you read about in Acts chapter 18. If We're not going to go read that, but if you recall back to Acts chapter 18, when Paul established, or uh, planted rather, the Corinthian church, Sosthenes was the, ruler of, the chief ruler of the synagogue who took Paul to task and to trial before Gallio. And Gallio didn't hear the case because he viewed it as a dispute among the, amongst the Jews. And then Sosthenes, Sosthenes was beaten, but he was a Jew. Some have suggested that that same Sosthenes is this Sosthenes, which would indicate that he had a pretty drastic conversion. But it could be, that's possible, but we just don't know for sure. Uh, we do know that he was familiar to the Corinthians. We're not really sure how he serves here. Some have suggested that he is the scribe that helped pen this letter, uh, but if you look at those individuals who are listed as scribes in other books of the Bible, it's very uncommon for them to, to list their names out in this way. And so that's led some to believe that he really wasn't a uh, scribe of the letter, but rather that Paul uses uh, 
Sosthenes to show that he's a team player, basically. He's showing that he isn't just sort of this rogue maverick missionary, but he's somebody who's involved in cooperation with other brethren in the work that they're doing, which would make sense in the context of this letter because these people were not getting along. And so it could be the case that he's mention, mentioning Sosthenes to show that he uh, is, a, is a team-focused uh, missionary. So that's verse 1. Verse 2, unto the church of God, which is, or that is in, Corinth. So this identifies the destination of the letter. It's the church of God. The term church is from the Greek term ekklesia. Ekklesia is a compound word that combines the preposition out of with the verb to call. And so literally the word means call, the called out ones, to call out of. So those who were called out. Now this word was used uh, before the Christian era. This word was used to describe uh, Greek political and social assemblies or, uh, that are similar kind of to uh, maybe some civic groups today. It was used to show that it, it, a group, a membership of something that had defined uh, membership. It's also used uh, by the early preachers of the gospel to refer to those who were of the Israelite tribe in the wilderness. In Acts chapter 7, in verse 38, Stephen refers to the church which was in the wilderness. We know that's not referring to the Christian church, but it's just referring to the fact that this was a distinct group of people who were assembled together. That's the idea of the term. And so, of course, in the Christian era, it's taken on a kind of a new meaning. And it begins to be referred, uh, used to refer to those who have obeyed the gospel of Christ, who have now been called out of the world and into the body of Christ as a called out distinct group. But the focus is usually on the fact that they're an assembly, a group of people. And so the church of God designates its ownership. It belongs to God. The Corinthians needed to understand this because many of them maybe thought that the church belonged to them and the way that they were behaving indicates that type of behavior. He's saying this is a church that belongs to God and it just happens to be in Corinth. The Corinthians may have thought that maybe they were the centrifuge or the, the, the headquarters of the Christian church. They thought that maybe they were the only ones who were Christians and everything sort of surrounded around them. But he's reminding them, you're just, yeah, not that that's a derogatory thing, but you're a church of God which is in Corinth, just like the Church of God or the Church of Christ that is in any other locality. And so the term church is used uh, to refer to the church universal, all of those at all locations and all times who have obeyed the gospel. It can refer to all of those Christians in a certain locality, in a city or a region. It can also most commonly refer to the assembly, the local assemblies, just like this is the Church of Christ that meets at Northside or on Hogansville Road. We're just another assembly of God's people. And so he's identifying who he's writing to, the church of God, which, has, which is at Corinth. To them who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints or holy people. So here we need to break this verse down a little bit. It says, to them that are sanctified. I like the American Standard translation a little better here because I think it gives the better sense of the Greek verb. To them that are sanctified. That shows a present condition, correct? But in the Greek language, their verbs don't have the same tense that ours do. They're similar, but they're a little different. Let me explain. When it says that are sanctified, are sanctified, in the Greek language, that's a perfect tense verb. And all that means is that that is a present, it indicates a past action, a definite past action that has lasting effects to today. So, for example, if I were to say on October 10th, uh, 2001, I tied my shoe, okay? That indicates a past event, but it probably doesn't have any lasting effects to me today. I guess perhaps that kept me from, from tripping or something, but there's no lasting effects for me tying my shoe back then. That's not a perfect tense verb. But if I were to say something like, well, uh, about an hour ago, I ate dinner. That's more of a perfect tense because it indicates a past action, but I'm still kind of absorbing the energy from that food. And so it's indicating a, a, a present condition based on a past event. And so in this particular context, he's saying you who are sanctified, really it's you that have been sanctified. It's referring back to the event in which these people became sanctified, which of course was at the time that they were sanctified by Christ the time that they obeyed the gospel. You have been sanctified because you have obeyed the gospel and you continue to experience the benefits of that condition because of your being in Christ. 
And so they were sanctified in Christ. It denotes the location. Called to be saints. That term called literally means invite. The idea is there's an invitation that's been made. We know that we are called by the gospel, just like these individuals were called by the gospel. We respond to the hearing of God's word, Romans 10, 17. And so they were called to be saints. They were invited to be saints, those holy ones. And so when we, uh, like we're going to do later on tonight, and when we do at the end of a sermon in our worship services, we offer what's called the invitation. That could just as easily be called the calling. It's Christ's calling. Uh, Christ used this very term to indicate what he was doing when he was preaching the gospel in the parables. Uh, he, remember the, the phrase, many are called but few are chosen, when he's talking about the parable of uh, the king who invites all these people to his banquet? It's the invitation. And so when we offer the invitation, we're not just doing so as a matter of uh, sort of our own personal traditions. This is something that is about as biblical as you can get. Christ is calling us by his word, and so it makes sense that when the word is preached, we offer the call and the invitation for people to respond to that. But these individuals had responded, they had been sanctified, and now they are saints, holy people. Verse 2, also, with all, then in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And so here again, he's connecting their Christianity, their being in Christ, not just with those who were in Corinth, but he's reminding them that they're part of something larger. They're part of the universal church. They're, uh, they're a constituent part of the church that has been established in all other places. It's not as if they were the hub and everybody else sort of branches off from them. It was more like Christ is the hub and every congregation branches off from Christ. And so here, he's showing that you are a Christian, but guess what? All those in every other place calling upon the name of Jesus Christ or obeying the gospel, uh, both theirs and ours. And so he's associating them not just with the church at Corinth. He's reminding them that they're part of something greater. They're part of a larger Christian fellowship with all those who, who have obeyed the gospel and other congregations. One has said that Paul was trying to tell them they're not the only pebble on the beach. There's others, uh, other congregations of the Lord's people, and they did not possess Christ for themselves alone. Verse 3, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a fairly common way for Paul to greet his audiences uh, in his epistles. Um, a lot, uh, many of the commentators I read suggest that this is just kind of a, a common way for somebody back then to say, hello, how you doing? That's sort of the idea. It's a general greeting. And here, Paul combines the Greek greeting with the Hebrew greeting. The Greek greeting would be grace, or charis. Uh, and the Hebrew greeting was peace, or shalom. And so what he's doing here, he's combining these greetings, and he's uh, addressing, because he's addressing a group of people who were Gentile and Jew, uh, of Jewish background. And so that's what some have said, but also other commentators have said, well, these terms have a lot more deeper meaning than just a high hello. It refers to the, it's like a wish prayer. He's, he's praying and wishing these things upon them. Grace, the unmerited favor of God, and the peace that comes from the unmerited favor of God. And so depending on who you read, these terms have a very special significance. But uh, from, from God the Father and the Lord uh, Jesus Christ, a standard greeting. And so now we're going to shift to in the, into the thanksgiving portion uh, of these first nine verses. He goes on to say, I thank my God always on your behalf or concerning you for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Paul must have spent a great deal of time in prayer. It appears that of all the congregations he writes to, he seems to always remind them that he's thanking God for them. In his letters, you'll see him just spontaneously break out into prayer like he's doing here. Paul was a man of deep conviction and he was a man of prayer. He prayed often for those uh, congregations who he helped to establish and those that he did not. And so he's thanking God. And it's interesting that he is not here putting the focus on the people. He's not praising the people here. In many other epistles, he praises the people for good things that they were doing in this Thanksgiving section. He'll thank God, but then he'll go on to say that uh, of all the good things that were going on at the congregation, the Philippians, uh, we won't go and read all these verses, but I'll just sort of summarize now, what he praises the people for. To the, in the Philippian letter, he praises them for the fellowship they have in the gospel. Uh, in the Colossian letter, he praises their faith. He praises their love that they have for all the saints. The Thessalonians, he has a great deal of praise for. And it's interesting that the, Thessalon uh, the Thessalonian church was founded or established, uh, planted, not too long before the church at Corinth. So they started about the same time. 
But Paul, in writing to the Thessalonians, he commends their work of faith, their labor of love, the patience of hope, uh, the fact that they received the word in affliction, but yet they still received, received it with joy. They were examples to the believers in the area. Uh, they sounded out the word of the Lord. The faith grew and love towards each other grew. And so he had a lot of positive things to say to these other churches, but to the Corinthian church, he doesn't mention that. He does, however, thank God. His focus is upon God. He's thanking God for what God has done for these people, but yet not praising the people themselves. And so he thanks them for the grace that was given through the means of Jesus Christ. And here's how. That term, that, uh, that really should be because. Uh, that term in the original is a term that's called hati, is how you pronounce it. And it's a, a conjunction that really means because. It shows a causal relationship. So he's saying, I thank my God for the grace of God that was given to you uh, through Christ. And this is how it happened. Because in everything or in every way, you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. He's telling them that they had received the fullness of the knowledge uh, of the gospel. They came behind in none, uh, to none. They had the entirety of biblical truth. Paul was there for a year and a half preaching to these people. And if you haven't heard this phrase, uh, I want you to understand it now. I think uh, some people have the idea that because they didn't have the New Testament in written form back then, they didn't have access to all truth like we do today. But that's just not true. Because they had walking, talking, living, breathing apostles who were inspired men of God who were basically walking New Testaments. So they didn't have the word in written form, but they had access to the apostles and the access to these miraculous spiritual gifts, which enabled the truth to be spread. And so while the apostle Paul was there for a year and a half, he told them everything. They had, they had literally the best form of knowledge, uh, utterance and speech and knowledge. The speech is uh, the discourse and the knowledge is that which is given to the person through that discourse. It's interesting that term enriched. That term enriched means to cause someone to have abundance of that which is of value and worth. It'd be one thing to give somebody an abundance of something that doesn't, isn't, doesn't amount to anything, but if someone were to walk into this room today, maybe a jeweler, and he says, hey, hold out your hands, and you hold out your hands, and he just starts dumping two carat diamonds, and they're just overflowing onto the ground. That's the idea here. Giving abundance and above and overflowing of something that is of value. And so he's saying that you were enriched. You literally had all the spiritual riches that uh, could have been bestowed upon a church. And unfortunately, they did not use that to God's glory, which, of course, he rebuked them for later. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. And so the testimony of Christ is the gospel, the facts of the gospel, uh, the truth that we read about in the New Testament. And uh, it was confirmed in them. And it was confirmed in them how? By the spiritual gifts. In the first century, the message was confirmed by the miraculous, which is what he talks about here. He says, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That term gift really should be spiritual gift. In the original, that's what that term means. And the waiting is more than just sort of a, you know, waiting in the line at the, at the Department of Driver Services. It's not this impatient waiting. It's kind of an eager waiting for something to happen. That's what that term implies here. And so he's telling them that the word was confirmed and you've come behind in no gift. You don't lack any spiritual gift. They had all of the nine miraculous spiritual gifts that were available in the New Testament world. And we're going to read in detail about what those were in chapter 12. But he's telling them you didn't come behind in anything. You literally started off with everything a church could hope to start off with. You, start off, you started off with the same thing that all these other churches that I praise started off with. You started off right. You didn't come behind in any of these things. You didn't lack in any of these gifts. But apparently they were not using the gifts which with they had been endowed uh, for the building up of the body. These gifts were given to them to build up the body of Christ, to be what they were supposed to be. It's as if Paul walked into this congregation and converted all of us, if we were, were not Christians, and he gave us all a brick. And every, some bricks were bigger, some were smaller, but we all had a brick. And that we were expected to build something up with those bricks. Paul leaves for a few years and he comes back uh, when we're here on a Wednesday night and he sees us all throwing the bricks at each other. We're not building anything up. We're trying to hurt each other with the bricks that God has given us for whatever reason. That's kind of what they were doing. They were given these the spiritual gifts, but they were abusing them. They were not using them for the building up of the body. They were using them to fulfill their own selfish purposes, which uh, we'll see later in the book. 
who shall also confirm or sustain you unto the end, that ye may be blameless or unreprovable or guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling them that as long as they are in Christ living faithfully, he's going to confirm them unto the end so that they still can be blameless. They started off blameless and they're being sanctified by the blood of Christ. But that wasn't the end. They just, it's not just uh, one and done. Once saved, always saved. They had to continue in their sanctification. They had to continue in their obedience and faith of the gospel. And they were to live in anticipation of the second coming. And in living in anticipation of the second coming, we're to live blamelessly or faithfully before God. One has said the Corinthians had not yet arrived. They had thought in their minds that they, they, had, they had reached uh, what they were supposed to be. And they were just kind of living it up until Christ would come back. Paul had to remind the audience that their conduct and character were yet to be reviewed by the judge. Christians, therefore, start blameless in their conversion to Christ and are to remain blameless by faithful living as set forth in the New Testament. Christ will provide the, he's already provided the test to tell whether or not we're living in faith. You know, how can one know? Well, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, the Apostle John says, Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And so he will confirm those. He will continue to hold those blameless who he originally sanctified through his blood that will remain faithful when he comes back. God is faithful, verse 9. I won't talk about this now because that's one of our discussion questions. But at the end of verse 9 it says, By whom you were called unto the fellowship of or with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Those who are sanctified, those who are Christians, are called into a fellowship with Christ himself. That term fellowship means communion. And a better way to understand that is common union. We have a common union with Christ. Paul reminds them that they are sharing in Christ, which means far more than merely being together as a fellowship of friendly faces. It signifies sharing the status of being in Christ and of being shareholders in a sonship derived from the sonship of Christ. We are adopted sons and daughters of Christ because of what he did for us on the cross. And in that sense, when we become Christians, we're in fellowship with him. We have a common union with Christ. And the thing that the Corinthians need to realize, and that you know, all Christians need to realize, is that when we have this common union with Christ, when that vertical fellowship is established, that then automatically includes our horizontal fellowship with all those who have vertical fellowship with Christ. All those who have fellowship with Christ, we are to have fellowship with. And that's going to become important as we start to talk about the concept of church discipline and what it is uh, to have fellowship and what it is to withdraw fellowship and so forth. But he's reminding them that we're called into the fellowship uh, of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so that's just sort of a, a, an introduction uh, to, the, to the text itself. Uh, Paul here introduces the letter to the uh, to, uh, first Corinthians. And so now let's turn our attention to the questions. And I hope that uh, all of us have prepared these. But let's look, uh, first of all, at question number one. It says, which chapters in the book of Acts give an account of Paul's conversion? All right, so uh, Mr. Bill gave this for the verses, and so, uh, so chapter 9, right? That was the initial recording of Luke of Paul's conversion. Uh, then in chapter 22, what was the context there? In chapter 22, what was the scene that Paul is recounting his conversion? Paul was answering charges. He, uh, Paul was answering charges. Uh, he was actually before uh, the, the Jews in the temple courtyard. He was standing on the stairs uh, of the castle of Antonia. And so he, that discourse was before the Jews. And then how about chapter 26? That was before uh, King Agrippa, right, in the courtroom. Yeah. All right. So in both of those cases, Paul is just recounting what happened to him, which the original account can be found in Acts chapter 9. And so Acts 9, 22, and 26 for those who did not get those. 9, 22, and 26. Question number two. Which chapter of the New Testament gives the account of Paul planting the church at Corinth? Chapter 18. Very good. Talked about that last week. In what ways was Paul different from the other apostles. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just kind of say some things uh, that made him unique compared to the other apostles. He was the only one not called personally by Christ. 
He wasn't called personally? What I mean by personally is Christ in person on the earth. In his earthly ministry. Christ called him, but this road to Damascus experience was along the order of a miracle. When you add in, you know, his sight and, you know, going blind and all that. Mm-hmm. But uh, he, he was the only one, and I think he refers to himself, called out of season. Didn't he say Apostle that? due season. Mm-hmm. Called out of due season. He, he was called, co- yeah, Mr. Bill. He was Christ's chosen vessel. Here you go. To go to the Gentiles. The gen- he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Good. That was his primary mission. Right. Good. Not about the other Jewish I think it, it was um, the difference between Paul and the rest of the apostles. The, the rest of the apostles followed Christ during his earthly, earthly ministry before he was killed and was resurrected. And one of the qualifications to be an apostle was that you had to have seen the resurrected Lord. The rest of the apostles saw the resurrected Lord before he ascended into heaven, as recorded in Acts chapter 1. Paul was called after the fact. He still saw the risen Lord in a vision. And, of course, uh, Ken mentioned the, the miracle about him going blind. But he had witnessed the risen Lord as well. It was just a, a matter of timing, really. And so that, those are some differences. So he didn't follow Christ in his earthly ministry. Uh, he did not witness the risen Lord before the ascension. He was selected as an apostle to the Gentiles. Those are the three uh, big ones, I would say. And there's, of course, some others. Uh, question number four. Yeah, I'm sorry. He was a Roman citizen. There you go, a Roman citizen. He was, which, a, he was a only disciple baptized with in water. Okay. He developed that a little bit. He, he, he was baptized in water, the rest were baptized in fire with the Holy Spirit. And I think that they were a disciple of Jonah. And Jonah baptized in water. Mm-hmm. Jonah was baptized in water. Well, Jonah baptized in water, and then Jonah's disciple. Good. That's one of the qualifications that they put forth when they were choosing somebody to take their Jesus' place. Which of these men from the baptism of John had been with us? So they were great disciples of John. Mm-hmm. Very good. But I, I, Mr. Terrell, uh, Paul was the only one uh, baptized, I guess, uh, after that original group uh, of John's disciples. And, you know, you talk about the day of Pentecost. He was the only apostle who was baptized after all of that took place. That would be correct. Uh, where does one receive the grace of God? Where is it? Where's the location that grace is accessed? In Christ. And only in Christ, right? So in these verses, we just read in verse 4 uh, that Paul was thankful for the grace that was shown to them in who? Christ. Ephesians 1.3, blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places where? In Christ. And so the uh, grace of God is received in Christ. Question number 5, to what does Paul refer when he says the day of our Lord Jesus Christ in one eight? What was that, Ms. Barbara? The coming, of Christ. the coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ, right? The day when he will come back and take his own, uh, where all will be resurrected. That's what he's referring to, the second coming of Christ. All right, with the time we have left, let's, uh, let's turn our attention to the discussion questions. And uh, number six, I'll just read the question. Uh, what are some ideas that Paul was trying to convey to these brethren who lived in a particularly corrupt city? Good. Anybody else? They had been called out of the world of sin. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they should uh, not be, again, corrupted by the things that surrounded them in the city of Carl. Mm-hmm. They had been called out of that, so you don't go back. Good. That the relationship that is up there now becomes through the obedience of faith, which one is baptized in. 
Mm -hmm. So they, they were called to a radically different lifestyle to what they had been brought up around and what they came out of. They were called to a distinct Christian holy living. They were saints. They were to be holy people. And in a corrupt society, that requires some effort on the part of the people who are trying to pull out of that. Because you still have to go to work. You still have to interact on a daily basis with this world. You still have to see it. And it can be easy to slip back into that. Uh, but it seems like the church at Corinth, you know, if you just kind of a simple illustration, and it's not perfect, but, you know, they're called to be a hard boiled egg. They're to be in this egg. And there's to be defined borders about what's acceptable conduct within the body of Christ. And so when those. Other ingredients try to make it into that hard-boiled egg. You know, things of the world, they just hit off the shell and bounce off. That's what God called them to, holy living in the body. But they had become more like a scrambled egg. You kind of spread out, and you can put anything you want in there. You can put the ham in there, the peppers, the onions, uh, whatever you like in the egg. That's what was going on. All the things of the world were being dumped into what was supposed to be the church to where you couldn't even distinguish what was the church and what was the world. What are some things today in our society that should be avoided by the church with this in mind? Rap music. Anybody else? <laughs> Anything that's not outside of Scripture. Exactly. That's, that's our benchmark, right? The Scripture. Okay? What else? Uh, lots of television. Television programming? It's all there when we talk about all these things that we should avoid when we don't want to get thrown back into a world of sin. What I have seen through my life and the life of some of my family members, it's not necessarily going back into these things. It's not filling your life with enough good things where these things don't pull you back and with enough instruction on how to avoid these things to begin with. And so I think Paul is trying to tell us in Corinth, okay, I'm going to, he's about to tell them, I'm going to tell you how you quit doing these things and quit being drawn back. And I think sometimes the, we as a, a church fall short of that by not teaching, especially young people, how to avoid these things or how to get away from them once they are subject to them. So, I mean, that's just what I see. And, and when I was growing up, because we had strong elders when I was growing up, and they gave us instructions on how to avoid these things and, so, and how to live with in the world but not of the world. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Education, obviously, if we don't understand, you know, why we are doing what we're doing, why we're avoiding the things how to do it, then it's, it makes it a lot more difficult. Let, let's look at, uh, if you would turn to 1 John chapter 2 in verse 15. Let's just read this verse before we move on uh, to the next question. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, and whoever's next in our reading line, I, I think it might be Mr. Gerald, I could be wrong. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 in verse 15, let's read that together. doesn't mean we don't can't have any affections for earthly temporal things there's a lot of things that are wholesome and healthy to engage in that aren't necessarily spiritual activities but what he's saying here is is the world in the terms of the sinful world the life of sin uh, we're not to be of the world there should be a clear distinction between us as Christians and the world round about us. And when that line starts to become blurred, it's either society has become really holy, which we know is not happening, or the church is becoming more worldly. It's one of two options. And so we need to uh, you know, consider these words prayerfully that Paul is communicating to the Corinthians about their own holiness in the midst of a sinful world. So very good comments. Uh, number seven, do these texts indicate that Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross made it possible for those who follow him to be found blameless at the second coming. Let's just get a short response to that and focus more attention on the second part of this question. Yes. yes. Absolutely they do. 
That's, what, that's why we need Christ, so we can stand before uh, the judgment seat and be found blameless because his blood covers us. Now, part B, does this eliminate any conditions on mankind's part? No. Why not? Because we must continue to think and fast, as we said, and be grounded from, until that day. Mm -hmm. If he's not, Anybody else? References. You've got walk by faith, walk in sanctification, mm -hmm. walk in love. Um, those are all proactive ways of demonstrating faith that complies with what James taught. And by the way, it's a whole lot easier to take positive commands to walk in these things that pleases God than it is to be busy all the time about not do that, can't do that, don't do that, because I tried that approach, and it doesn't work. If you're just solely focused on the negatives, what you can't do, shouldn't do, um, you're not going to have enough of the right kind of energy to carry you what carry your way through life. You're going to hit a dead end every day more than one time. It's just extremely difficult to live until we have started being proactive and we're going to be people of joy and we're going to be people of peace. We're going to follow after righteousness. We're going to follow after holiness. We can invest ourselves into the Christian living and come out way ahead. So you got to fill up with good, not just take away the bad, right? Exactly. Uh, fill it up. But let's look at uh, quickly Colossians one twenty three, because I think it kind of points out this concept that Bill and others have been referring to: is that there are still conditions there, even though we become Christians, even though we've been sanctified. It's not that's the beginning. It's a continued marathon until Christ comes back. Uh, Colossians 1.23 highlights that probably uh, the best. And uh, Mr. Frank, would you read that for us? If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every Christian under heaven, of which I, Paul, I became a minister. Very good. If, small word, a lot of meaning, right? And you got through talking about right before that, about their being able to stand blameless on the judgment day, if you continue. That's the Christian message. Uh, message. That does not mean that we're sinlessly perfect. Don't misunderstand what we're saying. That's not true. If we were sinlessly perfect, we wouldn't need the blood of Christ. But we are called to be faithful. We are. We're called to holy, righteous living as specified in the New Testament, as specified by Christ and his apostles. And it's a complete farce and it's complete error to teach that once you've been saved, you're always saved regardless of your conduct following that. That's cheap grace, and that's not what the Bible teaches. We're called to be holy, uh, righteous people. All right, so that's number seven. And then number eight, and we'll just uh, close up here. Uh, Paul tells the Corinthians, God is faithful, one, uh, one in nine. And then also I had uh, you guys read Deuteronomy 7, 9, where a similar uh, statement is made. In what ways is God considered to be faithful in these texts? That's right. That's absolutely right. That's probably the most uh, succinct way to put that. He's trustworthy. When he makes a promise, we can rest upon that. And our faithfulness is predicated, is built upon God's faithfulness. Because he is faithful, I can have faith and trust in his promises. And so God is indeed faithful. He's faithful when he says that he's going to uh, view us blameless on the judgment day if we continue. In, this, in, in the lifestyle of faith uh, in the body of Christ. And so that's very important that we understand that. God's faithfulness is necessary basis of man's faith. Uh, for next time, uh, read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Very good discussion, by the way. Appreciate your comments. Everybody uh, continue to participate in class. That was very good. Uh, I have the handouts here. Uh, what I'll do is I'll leave them in the back uh, so you can pick them up on the way out. Uh, but for next time, read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 10 through 17, only eight verses. Uh, read the handout, and then also answer the questions and be prepared 
uh, to discuss that. And at this time, we will close class and begin our devotional period. Thank you for your attention. We'll take the song, we'll turn to page 732. 732. <clears throat> we praise thee, O God, for the Son of our love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, and the glory, hallelujah. Turn me to page 708. Walking in sunlight all my journey over the mountains through the deep Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee from this divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing your praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and God. He is a light, him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to his side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flood my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly and walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, and in the sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. A lot of negative things to say about the things that were going on at Corinth, but in these first nine verses, I think we've seen something very positive. Paul putting focus on God and what he had done for these people. If you notice the text carefully, in the beginning, he reminds them about who they are. He reminds them about what God has done for them, and then he also reminds them about what they were to be. And in this context, there's some very, very encouraging words, even though the rest of the book may not be what we consider encouraging. 
But there's just a few things I'd like to point out that are very encouraging about these first nine verses in 1 Corinthians. Even in the midst of a troubled church, there can be hope. Paul would not have written this letter if he did not think these people had it in them to change. He took enough time and effort to highlight the things that they needed to change with the mind that they could and that they would. He had faith and he had hope and trust in these brethren that they could change. And so even in the midst of a troubled church, even in the midst of a troubled Christian, there's always room for change because the gospel can change hearts. It can change lives. I know you believe that. Also, the reason there can be hope is because God is never so far away that he cannot be found. For the Christian, he has the ear of God uh, in, in a prayer. But God is never so far from us that he cannot be found. And furthermore, we are never so far away from him that we cannot find God. Even though we may do things to estrange ourselves from God through sin, there's always a way back to him through his son, the mediator. It's a mediator for us. He's the propitiation for our sins. Also from this, these passages, we learn that God is faithful, which shows us that God's standards never change even when we do. We can trust in his immutability. We can trust in the fact that he does not change. His nature does not change. His promises do not change. We live in a changing world. We live in a world in which people disappoint us because people do change. People do go back on their word. People do disappoint us, but with God, that is impossible. He's faithful, and his standards never change, even when we do. And his provisions are always available to us if we'll just come to him. Any failure to find or to access the grace of God is a result of man's sin. It's not God's part. It's us that distances ourselves from God, not God distance, distancing himself from us. And also another thing to consider here is the church at Corinth, many would consider would be maybe one of the worst churches in the first century. I don't know if that's true or not, but in this book, in these first nine verses, we learn that the worst church doesn't have to be the worst church. It doesn't have to be that way. They started off with the same raw materials as every other congregation that has ever been established. Every individual Christian starts off in the same place in relationship to God speaking as any other Christian who has ever been converted. We all have different abilities. We all have different propensities to grow. But we all start off with the same raw materials in which we can be faithful. And so even though whatever point in the spectrum we find ourselves spiritually, there's always room for improvement and we can always change. We do never have to stay where we are, and that is encouraging. And that's encouraging as we consider the Lord's invitation tonight. If there are any here who have not become a Christian, have not obeyed the gospel of Christ by hearing the word, by believing it, repenting of sin, changing our mind, which is based upon the hearing of the word and results in a change of my lifestyle, confessing Christ before men happily that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and then being baptized for the remission of my sins. If you have not obeyed the gospel, I encourage you to do so tonight. If you have obeyed the gospel, if you have not been living faithfully, and you need to respond, and you need to come back to him, we encourage you to do that as well, together while we stand and sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other count I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this I plead, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other plant I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not a good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other count I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Please be seated. Just a few announcements before we dismiss tonight. Um,
got together a list of the Polishing the Pulpit CDs that have been here for a little while now. And uh, basically, I'm going to leave this out here on uh, one of the foyer tables. And there are some instructions on the front, but basically they say, if you would like any of these CDs, here's the list. Just go through these, and I have a number on the left-hand column, and you can see this in more detail when you pick it up. But every lesson has a number on it. If you would like any of these CDs, all you have to do is take one of the pink slips of paper that's in here, write your name at the top, and all the numbers of the CDs that you would like, and I'll burn you a copy that you can take home and to keep. And so just keep that in mind. I'll have these. Uh, this will be out on the foyer table. Uh, don't forget that we have just started a new class on Tuesday morning. Uh, it's not a new class, but a new subject uh, for the ladies' class, but all are invited. Uh, we're starting the book of Galatians at 10 a.m. on Tuesday mornings here at the building, and Mr. Bill is teaching that class. Don't forget our youth rally is coming up on the 20th, which is a week from this Saturday. Uh, it's very close, and uh, if any are desiring to help, we would love any, all and, uh, every and all members to come and to support this. But also, uh, we are providing lunch for the young people who will be coming. And so we have a sign-up list on the bulletin board now. Uh, we're going to have hot dogs, uh, chips, just some basic things. And we, but we need people to volunteer to bring some of those things. I wish I had a better estimate for the number of children we can expect. I've called every congregation we've invited, and I've only heard back from a handful of them. I've estimated between about 40 low-end, uh, high-end, uh, maybe 80. But... Then again, you don't know who in the community is planning on showing up, so it's kind of hard to estimate. And so I apologize for not having a better estimate. It's kind of hard to figure that out. But uh, if you're interested, please sign up on the bulletin board and just sign your name next to the thing you'd wish to donate. And we just ask that you please have the materials here by 8 a.m. the morning of the uh, youth day so we can make sure that we have everything. Um, don't forget about our Kids Sing program, which uh, takes place right, at the, uh, right before our evening worship at 6 p.m. on Sunday nights. Um, I have, uh, I'm glad Ed and Doris are back. We're glad that uh, they made it back from their trip to Tennessee. Betty and Philip are still on the road. Uh, we have many we, who we need to keep to remember in prayers, of course, uh, Paula, uh, Terrell. Uh, there's, there's some others that I'm sure I've, I've, I've failed to mention. Anybody else that we need to put on our prayer list for, for help? Yes. Uh, the family of Karen Hampton, our neighbors, has, here has, was, son nine. Karen Hampton or Hamilton? Yeah, son Oh, good. This Sunday? This Sunday night. Okay. This Sunday night, uh, Mr. Bill and Miss Linda are going to host our uh, second youth devotional at their house uh, immediately uh, following our PM services. And so let's uh, keep that in mind. Um, also, I have a, I have a benevolent need. Uh, Somebody has called in. I can explain the situation to you if you're interested after services. I'm taking a collection for all that want to. That's uh, completely optional, but I'm going to go pick up some groceries for a lady who needs some help tomorrow. So if you're interested in that, just let me know. If not, not a big deal. Uh, that's all I have. Anybody else before we dismiss? Yes, Mr. Bill? Good crowd tonight. Oh, yeah. Good, look, good looking crowd. Good to see everybody here, uh, all those who are visiting, especially all of our young people, and uh, great to see that. Seems like our education program is going very well, and uh, big, uh, big uh, thank you to the teachers and the students as well. Frank and Jean be leaving this Sunday. Okay, and that's right. I can't believe it's already... That time, it seemed like that was so far off. All right, Frank and Gene will be traveling. We know they'll enjoy their, their time on the road. Anybody else? All right, we'll stand one more time and have a closing prayer. studying of your word tonight. We pray, Father, that much good has come from these classes that we carried on tonight, that the things that be seeking down deep in the hearts of those who are in the class. We pray that you'll be with each of us now. We're about to leave this place of worship and go to our sacred place of abode. Give us a safe journey to our home and be with us throughout the week that we'll be able to leave in all things that we do. Be with those traveling in the, next, in the coming days and right now Give them a safe journey to their destination and back with us once again. Be with 
receive those who are in need of my prayers, those mentioned tonight and others who know of, maybe to your help and guidance that the doctors will do those things what we need to for their recovery. And can you be with us and give us our past sins? This is from the inside. This is from the inside. He said they were good for 18,000 BTUs. Five, 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 he said, this, this is a work. He said, you need to get a pair of check. If you don't make some nice enough there, you need to lay some up. You do it all right, buddy. Over the roof. And I said, I don't know. I never looked up there. I doubt it. Man, y'all heard it, huh? He said, you wouldn't even need to put some work. I said, well, he said that would take care of the over. Uh, it acts like a... Yeah. So anyway, I, that's that's it. Uh, matter of fact, I see it right there. Uh, 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 it's got to be something else that I'm trying to use. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the, then the pipe, the pipe that you come holding, about three inches, the pipe runs out, down to this thing right here. I told him, I said, he's talking about putting it in the back. I said, no, I ain't going to put it in the back. Somebody come on and step in the and put the truck bag off. I said, put it out front so people can see it. Well, 
Well, well it's, it's going to be. Well, I, it's, it's, it's like an act like a humidifier per se. But he said it would be.